Okay, hey, perfect. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. This is our last session of the year. And so we're very excited to bring a wonderful group of panelists here to discuss how to set up an onconephrology clinic and you know how they each did it at their own practice and hope we can all learn from their diverse experiences. Thanks, of course, to our industry sponsors, Renibus and BTG for enabling uh, us to have these educational conferences. Without further ado, um, I'm going to introduce our panelists. Um, but before that, Dr. Amy Yao, who is our main moderator, is going to be joining us soon. Uh, and she's the one who put this wonderful panel together. So uh, thanks to her. And we have Dr. Susan Zolkowski, who's a nephrologist at Stanford. Uh, she developed the program, Onconephrology program there at Stanford and a Northern California Onconephrology Conference series. She participates in grant-funded research studies on body composition and machine learning techniques in nephrology. We also have Dr. David Ortiz, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at Duke. Uh, he joined the practice there in 2014 after completing his fellowship there. He has, he's the current director of the Duke Onconephrology Clinic, which was established in 2015. He's really passionate about medical education as well as uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in medicine. Dr. Arash Rashidi is an associate professor of medicine at Case Western and the co-president of the American Society of Onconephrology. In 2014, he joined the faculty of university hospitals and is the founder and director of the onconephrology program there, which began around five years ago in 2018. And lastly, but not the least, of course, Dr. Javeri is the professor of medicine and associate chief in the division of kidney diseases and hypertension at Northwell. Uh, he's, of course, a highly regarded physician scientist and clinician educator in the field of glomerular disease and onconephrology. Uh, Northwell also has a joint glomerular disease onconephrology program. And Dr. Javeri was, as you many of you know, a recent recipient of the ASN's Distinguished Leader Award just last month. So the first question to everybody from the panel, and I'll call on you by your names, is, is sort of the existential question here as to how did you and your division decide that there was a need for such a clinic? And what are the very first steps that you took to sort of establish that clinic? Um, I'll go around, I'll start with Dr. Javeri. Hey, thanks, uh, Harish and all. Uh, thanks for this nice panel. Uh, so let me, I mean, I started the clinic back in 2010 at our institution. Uh, I mean, to give it the cl uh, name clinic is sort of false. It's really um, your, your, panel of patients to better call it that way. Uh, you know, you everybody sees as general nephrology in our division. Uh, it's just that there's you make these relationships with certain uh, physicians that will then send you patients. And that's your panel of patients. Now, if you want to make that Tuesday morning, then you can call it a clinic, onconephrology clinic. But, you know, eventually that will become every day <laughs> as time goes on. And you know, uh, some of my fellows can attest that, you know, we do see patients every day that are onconephrology in the office, that, but they're specifically referred to two or three doctors in the practice. So it really starts by building relationships with your referral uh, panels of hematologists, oncologists uh, specifically, uh, but that's where most of your referrals come from. So it's really going out there, talking um, and making those bonds uh, with your referral physicians. Um, just to contrast that to a cancer center where it's already done for you because you are practicing at a cancer center, but majority of us are not. Awesome. Um, and you spoke about division support there. So I guess I'll ask Dr. Zolkowski this. How did your division see this? How does how did your other colleagues sort of look at you when you said you wanted to start an oncology program? Can you sort of give more insight into the division support that went into uh, you know establishing such a clinic? Out of practice? Yeah, so we kind of have a little bit of a hybrid situation where initially my colleagues and I who were interested in onconephrology were just dedicating certain clinic space to onconephrology. What we've been doing now, though, is we did actually establish a clinic within the Stanford Cancer Center, which is also kind of a growing presence. Stanford's really trying to brand that recently. Um, because it's just been growing by leaps and bounds in terms of how many cancer people we've been seeing. So um, so the actual transition then once we started doing clinic in the cancer center, I think was really helpful for various reasons, um, but also resource-wise because um, oncology 
financially speaking, typically does a little bit better than nephrology, as many are well aware of. So we were able to tap into more oncology resources by actually having our clinic there. So that's been the big transition. And I think our um, clinic um, or our division chief just, of course, is rounding at Stanford and the inpatient service and clearly sees the growth of the cancer population here. So I think when we wanted to do it, everyone was thrilled because um, certainly they realized the need for expertise in this field and also offloading some people who may be less keen on seeing those types of complex people. So Dr. Zolkowski, if I understand correctly, you get you, you, you have physical space at the cancer center where you see patients and uh, the oncologists there know that you have that space and you have that clinic. And so it's almost like a direct referral to that particular clinic in that space. Is that correct? Exactly. Yes. And we partnered a lot with a rheumatologist as well, um, who's an onco rheumatologist. So it's kind of the three of the, the um, well, now four of us um, who really have been doing the majority of it. So um, yeah, we're just integrated. There's like a, you know, a breast oncologist who's always doing a clinic right next door to me and things like that. So um, that's been really nice to facilitate more collaboration and things, of course. That's awesome. That's awesome. Dr. Atiz, I know you've had this clinic for a while. Uh, how has your experience been over the years and what's changed? Well, first of all, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I think that for me, um, it's been a little bit different. Here at Duke, we do have a cancer uh, center that uh, similar uh, to Stanford, it's been growing. And the need was twofold. There, there was a need for um, pay, provide patient access in a more prompt ma uh, matter. Our lead way or waiting times for general nephrology uh, right now is three to four months. And of course, these patients cannot afford to wait that long. And so that patient access was a priority. Um, and so finding a way to centralize and, and, and stream the, line the pipeline towards access and provide immediate care, it was a must. Um, and the second uh, aspect of this was uh, to establish collaboration. In other words, you want the, the oncology colleagues to rely on you to be able to provide the follow-up necessary for these patients, the immediate advice, et cetera. So my, my clinic has evolved or, or the nephrology service that I provide has evolved to um, more of a virtual presence, like Kenar was saying, where now we offer, for example, e-consultations for, for checkpoint inhibitors induced AKI. Most of the time, the patient doesn't have to travel four hours to see me, but rather we can provide some meaningful uh, recommendations uh, electronically. So, so far, uh, it's, it's been doing really well. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Dr. Rashidi, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, uh, thank you so much, Harish and Amy, uh, for uh, working on this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, you know, uh, I heard, you know, uh, three different, you know, version pretty much. And uh, I think what it tells me is that every center is kind of unique in its own way. But the bottom line is that what is common between all these, and I will collaborate about my experience here in case with uh, physical presence and making good communication with oncologists is the key. So the way we started here in 2017, um, um, I approached our division chief and you know we had some preliminary discussion that you know this is a growing field. We have a big cancer center here. And that's a good idea if we establish this field here. So the most important part of the process was connecting to oncologists. That was one part. The other part, since you know, I didn't have much experience how to establish certain specialty clinic, I basically approached as many as colleagues across the country as I could. Uh, and I went through different websites. Of course, at the time there were not new, uh, there there were not many clinics uh, in this field. But I talked to many many people. I emailed many people. Uh, of course, you know, Kenar may or may not remember. I had a very detailed discussion with him. Always helpful as usual. And uh, many other people I talked uh, with my colleagues in MD Anderson, uh, MSK. So then the next step was connecting to oncology. So. Um, we started, you know, some communication with the oncology division chief. The idea was very well received. 
And the first step was a dedicated uh, place in cancer center because uh, I wanted to be in front of the eye. So oncologists see that there is such a service available rather than just sending an email and okay, there is a service and everyone forgets after you know, a couple of weeks, we, we all receive hundreds of emails. Many of them we delete and we don't even read. But um, when you are present in the cancer center, that makes a whole lot different. So um, I have a dedicated oncology clinic in our cancer center. It's every Monday morning. But when started growing, oncologists knew that, OK, I'm available all the time. They can reach me anytime via email, phone, or uh, whatever else. So I became the uh, point of contact for them. Then um, the other thing which kind of makes it different in my experience from others is that after a year or so, we decided to establish onconephrology consult service uh, in our center. Uh, all these consults in patients, they were being seen by our general nephrology service. And we created a new onconephrology inpatient consult service. And that made the field even more visible to our oncology colleagues. So uh, I'm the only one who is doing it. And of course, I have another uh, friend and colleague who helps me when I'm, whenever I'm off or out of town. And uh, she also has clinic for onconephrology outside the main uh, cancer center. But every morning I go and I run, that's, a, that's my first stop every morning. And I'm being seen by all these oncologists. So that makes a whole lot of difference. Then after growing, now I have you know lots of oncology patients, not just in my dedicated uh, cancer center clinic. I see lots of these patients mixed with my other patients in my general nephrology consult. And the reason is some patients cannot get to that certain location and I have opening in my other location. I just try to provide the same day, the next day or the max is two, three days after the you know service is requested. I try to be available maximum two, three days uh, to see these patients. Awesome, thanks for that. I'm hearing <clears throat> a lot of uh, a lot of focus on collaboration and uh, quick turnaround times for seeing these patients and perhaps physical space at the cancer center. It definitely helps in bringing up your volume of uh, consults and new patients. Um, I have a quick question to ask all of you, which is, and this is a question from a lot of our audiences uh, poll as well, which is that what part of your full-time clinical job does onconephrology play? Is it 0.1 FT, 0.2 FT? Can you put it into context of how much um, it sort of like ties into your overall job? Uh, when people are thinking of starting out, let's say a graduating fellow or somebody early into practice and they're thinking about establishing a clinic or having an onconephrology consult service, how much do you think that sort of like weighs into your overall role? I'll go in the same order, uh, Dr. Javeri, if you want to start first. Yeah, I, I would say like 0.4 FTE uh, would be sort of the way to go. Uh, be mindful that these patients are not going to get you the RVUs you need uh, in a practical world. Uh, so you do need to have dialysis presence, you need to have inpatient presence, uh, and also have a good work-life harmony. So, uh, you know, just uh, be careful what you ask for. Uh, I'll go with Dr. Zolkowski next. While you also answer your questions, can you also briefly tell me about like how many patients you see per half day in clinic so people get an answer of like what the volume is? Yes. Um, so I think what was tricky was most of us already had general nephrology patients. And then as we wanted to scale up everything, with our oncology, onconephrology, um, it was just a matter of, you know, you can't take on a, a, a humongous amount of people at one time, right? So um, I think right now I'm basically doing a half to a full day of clinic onconephrology specific. Um, I'm trying to scale down on my gen nef so that I can do more onconef. Um, but, you know, again, this stuff is a work in progress. Um, I would say that it depends on probably how you define onconephrology clinic because, you know, and I think this was one of the questions, maybe this will come up later, but, you know, you can do it from all sorts of things. It could be, we did it where every referral from the oncologist or hematologists comes to us, which is a lot. So we never really had any shortage 
it plus some additional things as well, but we never really have a shortage of patients. That's for sure. Um, I think you could be way more specific so that it doesn't become overwhelming. Um, but there's definitely no shortage if you want to do it that way. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that's kind of at least my personal, um, you know, but I'm, of course I'm still doing other things as well to meet my RVUs and things, but, um, and in a yeah. typical half day clinic, how many patients would you say? You see? Oh yes. Uh, a, I probably do one to two new people a week. We also have a nurse practitioner or a PA who has been great at offloading our returns to allow us to have a lot more news, which has been a fabulous. Um, so probably one to two news a week and then, um, three to four, or I know I would say four to five follow-ups at least a week. Perfect. Dr. Ortiz. Yeah, it's a, a hard question to answer because the, most of the oncology work is not just with the patients that you see in clinic, but there's a lot of, again, ongoing follow-up communications with uh, colleagues, um, uh, uh, instructions through e-communications, et cetera. Uh, I have two half-day clinics a week. Uh, I my, my work as an oncologist is in top of my general nephrologist, like most of you guys. So I still run on the outpatient dialysis uh, setting. I still run on, on Big Duke. Uh, which is very uh, a big token. So I have to accommodate that most of the oncology work, which is outpatient uh, into my already busy schedule. Uh, however, over the past five years or so, the, the panel has changed. And what used to be maybe two or three or four oncology patients strictly in, in, in my clinic, now I have a panel of 11 uh, to 12 patients of those um, 80%, 90% will be oncology related. Um, and one word of caution is if you're trying to start an oncology uh, service or, or clinic, to pr probably to do it a stepwise approach, not to try to do everything at once. And, and, and I explained in, in my experience, uh, I initially started collaborating with urology, for example. And what we created there was to streamline patients that did, uh, had a nephrectomy that developed CKD. And with that, we saw a lot of post-nephrectomized patients with advanced CKD later on that couldn't get a biopsy and had significant proteinuria. So th then we partnered with the uh, pathology to do a medical biopsy on every nephrectomy that is done at Duke. That by itself increased tremendously the amount of early referrals to my clinic. So now I have pathology directly sending me a referral saying this patient have a nephrectomy and also have FSGS, uh, can you see him? So that by itself can increase the number of referrals. And if you do that, and at the same time, try to do the checkpoint inhibitor related injuries and paraproteinemia clinics, it could be overwhelming fast. So you might want to do a, a step approach. If I have to re redo everything again, that's what I would probably recommend. Awesome, Dr. Rashidi, how about yourself? Well, uh, I kind of go with the canar. So it, you really don't want to just uh, try to be full-time oncanephrologist, you should have, to my opinion, uh, general nephrology practice on site because yes, you can be overwhelmed with lots of patients, but the fact is most of these patients are more complicated patients. And um, in a real life, you are not really able to see that high load of patients to support yourself. So you always need easy general nephrology patients to be able to support you on the other side. Um, if you are just doing, okay, two days clinic and all you are seeing is myeloma and this and that, first of all, you are gonna, again, to my opinion, these are more time consuming patients. You go through the chart, you see lots of chemos, depends on you know how these oncology notes have been written. Sometimes it's really frustrating to pull when certain medication was started, certain chemo was started. So that's really different than, okay, this is a patient with CKD4, creatinine was three, six months ago. That's the same, you just check PTH vitamin D, Da, 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 it's just five minutes. You need those kind of patients, to my opinion, uh, on side of your more complicated oncology patients to be able to support you, yourself. Um, that's my opinion. Hey, Harish, can I just comment? Of course. So, I mean, just to highlight, uh, you know, what Arash said that, 
I think a lot of this, you have to be careful as you up um, titrate your clinic and make sure you have enough support, whether that's an NP or a PA or another colleague to cover uh, some of these patients. Because if you're doing it solo, it's going to be very, very challenging as the floodgates will open up, like Susan said, very fast. Um, so at this point, 10 years into it, I actually don't see the simple onconephrology cases. They go to any nephrologist in the division and we get the, and then they will refer the complicated ones. Hey, this one should go to either Dr. Wanchu or Javeri. Uh, that's more complicated. Let's keep the simple, straightforward checkpoint AKI or TMA that is you know easily manageable by the regular general nephrologist. What that does is also gains experience for all your nephrologists and not, um, it's the same way we get, have to gain experience with everything. So. Uh, just, you know, giving it out there that just be uh, mindful of the load that will just open up. And um, just a quick question on sort of the tips to increase referrals. I know we spoke a little bit about, you know, to get direct referrals and so on and so forth. Do you all have your referrals to come through Epic or do they come to your email? Um, how do you get your referrals, basically? And I know Dr. Ortiz mentioned uh, the urology cohort. So, yeah. like, but how do you, how do you like, and mostly get your referrals? I get mix of the referrals. You know, if the patient is kind of complicated and sudden change uh, from oncology point of view, they just directly send me a message and I just schedule the patient. I'll see the patient tomorrow or the day after. But there are some certain patients, okay, creatinine level is just a little higher than what it was. Sodium level is just a little lower or whatever. They usually go through our central scheduling but they, they request onconephrology clinic mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, we have general nephrology. I have general nephrology clinic and my other colleagues, obviously, they all have. So uh, somehow they are being directed, uh, diverted to my clinic. But uh, most complicated cases are directly coming from oncologists. Perfect. We do a lot of email and we have a general email that any oncologist can email that goes to like our secretaries. Um, but um, a lot of times we have to function more like a private practice model, but we have to see the patient the very next day. You cannot just so three months out. Uh, so you have to be, uh, so texting is another way, like to, you know, it's, uh, it's another way we get consults through teams and so forth. Um, at our practice, we can self-schedule if we wanted to, and we can also do telemedicine. So, you know, I think telemedicine should be used extensively, if, especially if you're looking for urgent consults. And I think Dr. Zolkowski mentioned this before, like you could have uh, your referral set up in such a way that any referral from your cancer center or your hematology um, um, colleagues comes directly to like one of the two people who are really interested in oncology. This is all when you're ramping up. Uh, but when you're 10 years in, like Dr. Javeri, you might want to you know, um, give the tools to your colleagues to, you know, help them manage uh, and learn from their own oncology patients as well, which is also, um, I think, a really nice thing. Um, I do have one question before we move on to the next section. I know Dr. Rashidi mentioned a little bit about having an inpatient oncology service. Um, do any of you, can you, any of you give, you know, some more sort of your experience of like how that works and what the volume is and the utility of setting that up uh, within, you know, your burden of your general consult and dialysis and transplant, et cetera. Maybe Dr. Rashidi, since you only had, you said you had the service, you could go first. Sure. Uh, uh, in regards to volume, so like any other consult service, that could be up and down. There are busy days or flight days. I could say my experience since 2019, it's about four years now. I had as light as like one to two patients in my list, up to 12 patients in my list. So, but generally speaking, usually I carry about five, six patients, you know, um, on daily basis. But are you the only attending? Who's and I am the only attending. Basically, I just, you know, as I said, my first stop of the day is I just go to uh, our sideman, it's called Sideman Cancer Center. And I just see these patients, then I head to my, um, general nephrology clinic, or if it's Monday morning, I just go there and, you know, continue my onconephrology part. Um, the thing is, you know, then you become, okay, who's going to see the patients when you are off or weekend? The way I work is 
Friday evening, I signed to general nephrology consult service. So uh, over the weekend, general nephrology service covers my patients. They sign me back on Monday. If I am out of town, I'm on vacation. Uh, one of my colleagues who is uh, helping me on this, she covers, you know, probably a few weeks uh, during the year. Awesome. Uh, do either of the other three of you have an inpatient service? No. Okay. Um, okay, perfect. I think we'll move on to the next section. We have uh, still a lot more questions to ask. So over to Dr. Raj Chaudhary, who's going to be taking over. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to the panelists. Uh, great discussions. And it's very fascinating how everybody has their sort of entry into onconephrology and how they established themselves in the field. So in, in the segment that I will be asking you folks questions. It's more probably geared for um, uh, the quite many of the questions are coming from our younger faculty um, fellows that are looking into going into the job market. Um, and I'll preface the first question by just a little bit of my experience, because it also differs from everyone's experience here. In, um, so I was fortunate to come into an existing practice in patient outpatient onconephrology um, and focused on onconephrology with a cancer center. Um, now, my question, I guess I'll start with Dr. Javeri and, and then Dr. Rashidi. Having done this for 10, 15 years, for young trainees or young uh, uh, junior faculty that are looking at the job market, how do you see that time evolving between general nephrology versus onconephrology? Do you ever see more possibilities down the road of 100% onconephrology and not having much of that general nephrology practice? We can start with Dr. Javeri, having seen the evolution for the last 10 years or so. Uh, unless uh, the AMA decides to give uh, more dollars for RVU amount for nephrology outpatient practice, I don't think that's going to change. Uh, because if you want to, even in private practice, um, which the majority of our fellows go into, say they join a group that actually gets a lot of referrals from a cancer uh, you know, a group, uh, they're not going to be able to generate enough income uh, to for their salary unless they see dialysis patients as well um, and drive around to four different units. So just for practicality purposes, unless we get paid more for the RV amounts, it's not going to be practically possible. For researchers, yes, because you have protected time and you might get funding elsewhere, that's doable. If you get hired by Sloan Kettering or Dana-Farber or MD Anderson, which are pure cancer centers and hired by them, not for the affiliated institutions, maybe then it's a different story because you're constantly seeing only those patients. But majority of our other hospitals are hired by the school or university and there's a cancer center attached to it. So uh, just, you know, that's the, the realistic, uh, you know, view of things. Dr. Uh, Shidi? Yeah, I second Kenar. So, uh, you know, obviously the story of MD Anderson, Sloan Kettering and, you know, Dana Farber, it's totally different because they are pure cancer centers and that's all they see. They want or they don't want their onconephrologists, but that's not the story for uh, even bigger academic centers who are not just pure cancer centers, such as, you know, our center here. Well, we, we have a big, you know, institution here, you know, uh, nephrology is part of them and oncology is another part of it. So they have patients, but it's not like all patients are onconephrology patients. And really, I mean, again, this is my opinion. In real life, you need to be able to support yourself also. You are doing academic work, but that's not all you do. You also want to support yourself. And I am not sure if at the current you know, status, if someone could purely support himself or herself just based on seeing pure onconephrology and uh, you know, just passing on dialysis patients or general nephrology patients. Excellent. So because you, you know, the, the majority of the group, as you all have mentioned, are in the realm of private practice, most of our fellows go into private practice. So well, a question that we have uh, uh, for that segment of the population is for Dr. Ortiz, if you're in, you know, sort of in a hybrid model or in private practice and you have clinic, how do you, how do you stay in touch on top of the literature what type of educational um, um, initiatives have you participated in or recommend participating in? Well, yeah, so so that the more patients you see, the more you're gonna get exposed and the more you're gonna read about your patients. So it comes with practice, but I think that uh, it's gonna be pivotal to, to 
to engage with societies like this one. Uh, when I was started, I I I reached out to to Kenar and he invited me to the first symposium that they did in in Long Island, and and that by itself opens up a huge amount of uh, thirst for knowledge and try to apply what you learn uh, there. So I think keeping engaged with continuing medical education, keeping engaged with uh, seeing the the patients you get exposure, and then finally keeping engaged with the with the programs and so, uh, social networking like societies like this one, so you can. You know, I, I, when I have a question, I just I know I can text Kenar, for example, and, and brainstorm about a case. So, and that's how we we learn as we go. Dr. Zulkowski, I have a question for you. So, at Stanford, you know, you have a, a awesome general nephrology training program. How have you sort of integrated some of the oncology teaching educational component amongst your general nephrology folks? Well, so we started with doing a monthly onconef series, which is with oncology and nephrology fellows. Um, it's more case focused. Um, it also allows, you know, us nephrologists to learn amongst each other as well. So that's been great. Now it's expanding to UC Davis and UCSF. Um, so that's also what's super exciting for us. So yes, um, it's kind of evolving over time, but I think um, at least learning about the cases amongst each other has been really, really cool and really, you know, exciting. And I think, um, as much as we don't have specific cancer centers for any of those three centers, um, there's still a lot of cancer patients. So the stuff that we, you know, come through, it, we can still learn a lot, which has been great. Um, I think that's pretty much all we've really offering so far. I mean, we do, as of course, now have the onco-nephrology specific clinics. So the fellows who are more or less interested could shadow us in our specific clinics. Um, and that's kind of what we've been doing thus far. Now, one, uh, one question from the audience that we have is, uh, Onconephrology is so broad from an educational component. What are some of the high yield things to understand and grasp? Dr. Javeri, we can start with you. Oh, I think, uh, I mean, the high yield stuff for someone going into private practice is definitely myeloma. It's one that they should grasp and uh, toxicities of uh, some of the more common agents and hypercalcemia, malignancy and tumor lysis syndrome. I think those four probably is the highest deal because that will the most common stuff they'll see in practice, inpatient and outpatient. Dr. Rashid, any other thoughts? Yeah, I believe, you know, uh, you got to be familiar with the uh, effect of uh, treatments on electrolytes, uh, especially you got to be familiar with all these targeted therapies, immune checkpoint inhibitors, myeloma, and that line of, you know, issues definitely is going to be a big part of, you know, onconephrology and, uh, those are, I think, uh, the most important ones. It's it's excellent that you mentioned that. And many of our fellows also asked me that question. And frankly, the foundation of nephrology doesn't change as you just need that core foundation and you're sort of applying it to a different complex patient population. So having that foundation, acid-based electrolytes, and then just taking it to another step with the resources that exist. Um, so next question that we have from the audience is, as well is you you many of you guys are kind of in your mid careers now how do you devote or balance your clinical practice with your sort of continuing med medical education how do you balance that time between seeing patients and also keeping up with the literature um, do you have dedicated time or not we can start with um, dr ortiz i am still trying to figure out my life uh, and <laughs> work balance let alone you know, I have three kids, eight, six, and two. I am constantly being drained either by Duke or by my family. So it's really hard. I read when I can, to be honest with you. I, I try to do a lot of podcasts uh, when I drive into the dialysis units. Um, I, I try to to do some, some of these um, uh, conferences also online when I'm driving. But for the most part, I squeeze it. I don't have a protected time for that. I just have to do it whenever I find an extra time. Dr. Zolkowski? I agree. I think um, I love going to conferences and being able to have these opportunities and ASON has been incredible. So um, I think you're just yeah, trying to keep up with everything. And um, and then also having just built in meetings, you know, then by default, I'm, I'm pretty guaranteed to be um, involved, at least in some academic endeavors, because I'm meeting, you know, with my colleagues on a regular basis. Excellent. All right. I'll have one last question before we go on to the next segment with Amy. 
Um, my last question from each of you, and we'll start with Dr. Rashidi. Um, one advice you would give to a fellow coming out of training uh, that wants to pursue onconephrology or wants to have that part of their repertoire going forward. Dr. Rashidi? Well, my advice is that if you are interested in onconephrology, uh, this time is different than 10 years ago. So I'm always a big fan of more education and more training if it is available. If it is available, if you can go to fellowship, I would say go for fellowship. Because, you know, um, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, uh, it's going to be different than when this field got started 10, 15 years ago. So 10, 15 years ago, there was no onconephrology trained, fellowship trained nephrology. So most of us are self-trained and self-learned. And that's how we got to this field. Then now there are fellowship programs available. There are different arguments. Some are for it, some are not for it. But my personal opinion, not just in this field, is if something is available, you can always distinguish yourself and separate yourself if you want to uh, be successful in your career. You are going to be in a probably um, academic practice, and that is how you are going to really show that you are a different nephrologist who are uh, eligible to do this kind of work and you are the one who can run the program you are the one who can um, direct patients in right uh, right way my opinion is as long as training is available just go for it dr ortiz your your one final thought for uh, fellows entering the job market that are considering onconef yeah well in addition to that i would tell you you probably I got the sense here that everybody does a different way. It depends where the institution, the resources you have, the patient population, academic setting, rural, or urban. I think at the end of the day, if you are passionate about this and you want to try it, go for it. Uh, the beginnings might be hard. You will have to find the way, uh, but it's it's perfectly doable. And, and I think that you just have to adapt to whatever your institution uh, offers. And, and at the end of the day, you're taking care of a very complex patient population, and it turns to be very rewarding. So we'll do Dr. Zulkowski and then Dr. Javeri will have the final word on, on this segment. Dr. Zulkowski. I agree. I think it's such an exciting field and it's fun to work with the oncologist so closely. Research is obviously extremely needed and really ripe with opportunity. Um, and I think too, the whole field with um, at least in, in with the billing stuff, this is a little unrelated, but um, since it is such a clear um need for these medical subspecialties, not just nephrology. Uh, there's, for example, pulmonology, I know is getting killed because the, the urgent oncopalm stuff is very, very, very urgent, you know, in a lot of situations. So a lot of these other medical subspecialties are kind of sounding the alarm about um, billing and reimbursement. And so I don't know if some of that might change. I know at Stanford, the Department of Medicine is considering this because they do recognize the extra effort that we are putting in and the lack of additional reimbursement. So I don't know if the whole landscape as a whole may change in the future to recognize every you know field of medicine that's really stepping up to help cancer patients, um, in which case maybe um, financial situations may change in the future. I'm not sure, but that would be nice. Dr. Javeri, many of your trainees are here. So one advice that you've given your trainees that you'd give to everybody broadly that is entering the job market and wants to do onconephrology. No, I think uh, it's a tough um position for nephrology right now, as you all know, with the match. So it's hard to ask someone to do another year sometimes uh, because you have a lot of debt and a lot of uh, stuff to take care of as a family. So if you're pursuing a perhaps an academic career, I, I agree with Arash to really consider a third year. But if it's not possible, uh, I think there are programs that are, are starting to offer tracks within the two years. So, you know, go to a fellowship program that has uh, an onconephrology presence and mentors that you can work with. And within the two years, really gain that expertise during your clinic time, inpatient time, research time, or three years, whatever long the fellowship is. Um, and that's another way to do it without uh, breaking the bank. Uh, you know, So just you know, be practical about it. Um, it depends on your family situation and, uh, and so forth. Thank you so much, Dr. Yao. I'll pass it over to you now. 
Great, thanks. Uh, so I think that's been wonderful. My section is kind of to ask questions about how to grow the clinic um, and um, also like uh, research and things like that. So <clears throat> I'll kind of start with, I guess, um, beginning. So this was an audience question. So what did the, when you guys first started the clinic, what did the business plan look like and how did it change over time? Um, I'll start with Dr. Zolkowski first, actually. Yeah, this is still an evolving process. So yes, we are physically located in the cancer center, but unfortunately we are not billing any differently. We're still billing under the umbrella of nephrology. Um, and so I wouldn't say that we have really any unique business plan per se. Um, well, actually, so to get our um, uh, PA to hire us, we actually initially got that under a grant. Um, it was a cancer center grant that funded her first year. And then once it, we proved her productivity, then she was hired, you know, officially, which was kind of a unique uh, thing. Um, I'm trying to think what else. And then, like I'd mentioned before, yeah, I think the landscape at Stanford is changing because we talked about getting like a medical directorship position that may fund us a little bit of FTE so that, um, you know, the admin component could be covered for at least one of us, um, in the Anconef space, but, um, that is not going to work at least as of now, because, um, again, these other medical subspecialties are kind of requesting similar. So Stanford does not really know how to approach this right now. And I, I it is a very strong cause for concerns. So I don't know how this is all going to play out, but as of now, we didn't really do anything. I would say too, too disparate than just doing a clinic in a different space. All right. And how about you, Dr. Ortiz? Yeah, for me, it was relatively an easy sell because there was a huge need um, at Duke. No one no one was doing oncology. Um, so what I did, I, I, I met with the cancer center leadership. They they meet every month um, and I just presented my my plan. I tell them this is what I, what, what I want to do, what I want to provide. Um, and I want you guys to think about my name when you think about your patients with kidney complications. So, so I first uh, introduced the concept of oncology, which was completely unknown for by, by them at that time. Um, then I presented to uh, medicine grand rounds and to oncology grand rounds and and him and bone marrow transplant unit uh, grand rounds to to and, and and the presentation was pertinent to their uh, field um, and put my name out there. After that, a plethora of referrals came. Um, you know, it has evolved and it continues to evolve. And I sincerely hope that it will continue to evolve because the way we're doing it is non-sustainable. We do need more support. Uh, uh, after leveraging with, with my division, we are finally hiring a, a nurse, a triage nurse that will, will help me with communication of labs, uh, setting up labs, but also communicate, communicate results, triage, urgent referrals to put it in my clinic, et cetera. And then to build on that, <clears throat> Dr. Javarius and Rashi, since your clinics have been established for a while, if you guys can discuss your onconephrology clinic and how how it changed over time, especially in terms of the payment. So, you know, originally were you guys under the umbrella of nephrology and now is some of your FT or clinic FT covered by oncology? And if so, how, how were you able to negotiate that or at least get some of the uh, payments um, covered? So I'll start with you, Dr. Javari. Uh, so we tried the method that Susan has done in Stanford, but we had the whole billing, uh, you know, issue that was back in 2010. I didn't try that after that uh, because I started getting patients anyway, and I was able to see patients faster in my office and look at urine because I have my own microscope as opposed to going to oncology. So um, uh, the way we argued was that we can see your patients faster at our office than just once a week visit at the cancer center. So availability trumped. Uh, clinic space. So that's the way we kept everything under nephrology. But um, the volume part has definitely grown. And to challenge to that is what I think David was saying, that we might need more um, advanced, you know, advanced practitioner support or nurse support to help triage, to take care of the post labs. Uh, and that's where the biggest challenge is right now. And then just to a follow on that. So as you're thinking about hiring new support staff, do you think about um, approaching the cancer center to see if they will help uh, fund that position as well? Uh, it's it's a good idea, but if the clinic is not physically in their space and under their um, financial backing, I doubt they will support that. 
um, you know, I think we have enough volume to have nephrology support in our division, yeah, for that. And, and Dr. Can Shady, I add something? Oh, yeah, go ahead. That the, the, the other challenge that we we that I'm facing is that these patients come from sometimes two, three hours away. Yeah. And you know, you are the only person there. And and of course you can see them, your clinic is tomorrow, but they're here today. So what are you doing in this situation? Do you go the extra mile and go see them? You set up telehealth visits, sometimes cross states of telehealth is not an option. So I think that is also very challenging. Mm -hmm. so, so whatever we do, we try to do more patient center and see how we can accommodate them, but sometimes it doesn't work. And they are very sick. So traveling is not very, no, it's not a good option for them sometimes. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. So I try to do that in my clinic as well. So um, Dr. Rashid, do you have any thoughts about your business plan and how it may or may not have changed over time? Yeah, um, really, we don't have any certain special business plan. As I started, billing has been under nephrology, so um, it's not mixed with oncology. Yes, we are using uh, Oncology Cancer Center as the clinic, but billing both outpatient and inpatient consult service are under uh, nephrology. So there is no really change compared to what I used to do previously. In regards to um, you know location and uh, volume, well, initially these patients were just being seen in uh, cancer center. Then, as the volume grow and also you know everyone else um, kind of uh, mentioned that these patients are not you know coming from just uh, your neighborhood, so that these patients are coming from different areas. So I, I realized that, you know, it's better just to let these patients be seen in my uh, general nephrology um, office, which is on in the other side of the town. Uh, that's better. Beside, when you do that, it's also giving you opportunity instead of the patient waiting for one week and maybe even next week, your oncology clinic in cancer center is completely booked and overbooked. You don't have to wait, you know, one week, two weeks, or three weeks to see certain patient. So you have availability in your clinic, general nephrology clinic next day, two days later, just a schedule there. So nowadays, my uh, general nephrology clinic, which is in the other side of the town, uh, probably I'm guessing, you know, I don't have exact statistic, but probably about 30%, maybe more of these patients are not general nephrology, actually, they are uh, on kind of nephrology, and I really have a very busy, you know, practice uh, in my uh, general nephrology. So if you think about, like, thirty percent of these patients are roughly on kind of nephrology patients who are not able to come to your on kind of nephrology clinic, or they prefer earlier appointment. So that makes sense not to limit your uh, yourself to certain location or time. Great, thanks. And then I guess the next question is really about research. So how many, how are involved with you, how involved are you with research and is the research just in the nephrology clinic or associated with oncology? Um, and are you associated with any registries and, you know, did the research component kind of come after this clinic's been established or is that something that you started in parallel with the starting of the clinic? Um, so I'll, I'll go back to Dr. Zolkowski. Yes. Yeah, so I um, used to have a completely different research. I shouldn't say completely different, but a different research focus. And then when I started moving more into the onco onconephrology space, I would now working in um, two different realms. And so initially to kind of get going in that spot, I did get internal grants. Um, and then now we're yeah getting NIH funding. But um, the uh, projects though, yeah. So some of, some of, um, my main project is not, there's like a oncologist who helps support it, but it's not really part of a um, uh, oncology, you know, group. And then we also do some side stuff with BMT. Um, so we meet regularly with them about their work. Um, so that's at least personally what I'm doing. Um, my colleagues, um, like Suchi Anand is heavily in the research world, but she um, also has some other focuses as well. So um yeah, so a little here and there, but we don't have any um, current like um, uh, pharmaceutical contracts or any other sort of, you know, we're not doing any clinical trials or anything, which eventually we would like to, but we're not there yet. 
And the research that you're doing now, is that something that started when you started the clinic or something that kind of evolved later over time? <laughs> uh, actually, probably prior, I would say, um, or I guess I would say in, in, in parallel. <laughs> sure. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Ortiz? Yeah, no, I, 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 our research is definitely just a collaboration with other colleagues. We don't have any established research uh, program here, at least not yet. So no, no grant submissions, no FTEs for that. And, and the collaboration has been evolving since the creation of the clinic. And then uh, Dr. Javeri. So uh, it was somewhat simultaneous for me, but a lot of my research has been not grant funded and more collaborative work with other institutions and, uh, you know, within the nephrology division here, the hematology oncology division is not very research focused here. The clinical trials that we do mostly are glomerular disease based. Um, but I think soon because of the oncology presence uh, and the rise of the field, there will be hopefully trials um, that will enter the world of oncology. And um, Dr. Rashidi? Yeah, uh, in my case also, it's similar to uh, uh, other centers. Most, it's not like dedicated on kind of nephrology research program. We have general nephrology research uh, office, which is staffed by three, four research nurses. And most of my works are with uh, uh, other on kind of nephrology colleagues across the country with other centers, you know, uh, that's the major part of my research. Okay. And then um, the last qu audience question is, um, what's something that you wish you had known when you were trying to establish your practice? Uh, so we'll start with Dr. Zolkowski first. Um, it's, I guess it's um, the, the, the biggest still work in progress, I would say, is always this referral situation. I think we're trying very, very hard. There was definitely a period of time, though, like, like I had mentioned before, we we basically initially structured it so all oncology, all hematology referrals were coming to us, which was probably a little bit too much. We've done some strategies to alleviate that. But then on the other flip side is that I felt like we were actually missing some really interesting cases. For example, like um, some community um, oncologists who were sending us um, MGUS or something where that wasn't captured in the referral track that we had set up. So that was actually almost a bummer because it was like, oh, great. Now we're in the cancer center, but I'm seeing like nephrectomy after nephrectomy. This is not what I wanted to do. So there was a lot of growing pains and really establishing that. So I would say that, that probably <laughs> that's the, 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 the biggest struggle with all of this is, um, but it sounds like, um, yeah, as we've kind of come along and gotten more contacts with oncology and they know us, like, you know, at least we're, I don't think we're missing the main stuff internally. Um, but a, a lot of that, that initial setup was, is, is quite a struggle, at least at the beginning for us. Great, Dr. Ortiz. Yeah, very similar to me. And, and I think that looking back, we all do this because we love it. We're passionate about it. Um, but I think that if, if I talk to myself a few years ago, I would say, you know, there is value in doing this, but also there is value for the institution. And I think internalizing how much you bring to the institution, uh, you can use that as your leverage to, to request uh, for better institutional support. This is something that Duke uses for recruitment, for example, but it's also a better patient care. Uh, provides better access, provide a, a, a network of collaboration. So it does have added value to, to the institution. And knowing that from the beginning is important because it's not that they're doing you a favor, you're actually making the institution better. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Uh, Dr. Javeri, you've been doing this for a long time. Anything you, you wish you knew? <laughs> Yeah, I wish I knew it was going to blow up uh, in terms of volume. Uh, and, you know, I was not prepared uh, the first few years. And so it's it's now I know better. Uh, if there is something you need to be more, get the sort of, you know, plan things way ahead and have enough people or personnel before you start it. Uh, sort of like the transplant program. You can't just start without coordinators and, you know, things like that. So. And Dr. Rashidi? On this area, I don't know. It's a tough question. I can't really recall anything uh, which I might have done differently or uh, if I wish I had known. I mean, obviously, you know, 
as time goes, you become more and more experienced and you wish you had today's experience six years ago, that's for sure. But uh, other than that, no, not really. Great. Well, we covered almost all the questions. Um, so I, I just want to, uh, I guess, ask if there's any other questions or anything else that Harish and Rod felt like wanted to be covered. What One point I, I would like to make, um, and actually echoing Dr. Ortiz's point, is that um, obviously you need the renal division support, and I'm talking about academics, but also as you get yourself out there, you should venture into and look into how you can have an appointment with the medical oncology group as well. Um, and the advantage of that is having that space, that nurse navigator, and they're very you know, well-resourced. So that's one advantage we have here where many of the triage questions are already taken care of from the oncology side, the medical oncology side, by having that sort of dual appointment. So something to explore if you're going into oncology in academia. One of the other things that I thought was also important was how, you know, you if you get an opportunity to sort of introduce yourself to the oncology division, that's a, that's a great opportunity to do that. Like Dr. Ortiz's presentation or, you know, your con joint conferences or whatever it might be, just like put your name out there and show your face. And that's like, oh, we didn't know this existed. And a lot of them are like that. And then slowly you start to build those relationships. And um, I've also noticed that oncologists, you know, um, it's very weird that you see like they see like one very specific type of cancer and you keep seeing the same patients like i've seen so many sarcoma patients for example and um, you don't expect that but that's how you sort of start to learn about individual drugs and get more and more experience in certain drugs versus not so i thought that was great i mean the only other thing i would say is uh, make sure you do the conferences repetitively uh, because you know a lot of these cancer centers have a big turnover of oncologists and hematologists so keep introducing yourself to the new ones that come to uh, and we forget that and after doing it like the first few you get enough patients but then you know it, there's a turnover so you want to keep doing it yeah that's a great so point agree to that point sorry i interrupted you and no, you're... yeah to, to the same point you know it's very important to be available and they know that someone is available as kenar said you know uh there might be very high turnover and this oncologist might go, the other one is new, and sometimes even you don't know them. But when you are available, you, you are in front of their eyes. After a short time, they eventually know that, okay, you are the contact point, and you are the one they can send email or send message and talk to you about certain patient, and uh, your availability and uh, visibility is very, very important. I, I agree with that, and, and, and don't forget, about the mid levels, uh, APPs and PAs are very important in this process because sometimes when you think about MD oncologists, but these patients are seen very frequently and have a very good collaboration with the uh, mid levels. Excellent. So I think we're almost at the end of the hour, and this is our last educational series for the year. I wanted to take this time out to really thank Dr. Sita Pati and Dr. Yao. They've set a curriculum this year that was phenomenal. We've had international experts. We've had national experts. We've had fellows. We've had palliative care experts. And uh, they've left a blueprint for us to you know, continue to implement and improvise as we go forward. So thank you, Harish. And thank you, Amy, for being such great friends and, and colleagues of mine. Yeah, on that note, sweet. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, well, thank you, uh, Rod. It's been a pleasure. I know Harish feels the same way. Um, I do want to say thank you to our panelists. I appreciate all of your time and your experience. Um, I'm sure that you guys are available if anyone has any other questions in the future. Um, and we appreciate everybody for taking the time out to come uh, listen. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, right, you guys. Have a good rest of the day.